welcome you to what moves you uh, another talk from our series that we started actually exactly a year ago i want to welcome christopher gregory rivera and christian rodriguez for being here today um, we will introduce them a little later my name is anja hitzenberger i started through media life online photography classes a few years ago and now I want to also thank you for being here, for donating um, to this uh, event, uh, for donating to the Migrant Kitchen. Um, when I started this uh, a year ago, when the pandemic started, I wanted to help people. I found the Migrant Kitchen uh, and they do really amazing work. And so your donations are going to them. Um, they um, help people uh, by providing free meals to families of those impacted by um, COVID. And if you are in New York City, you can actually order from the Migrant Kitchen. Every meal that you order will give another free meal to a person in need. Um, so that's uh, where your donation is going. And their food is really good. I actually got to taste it. I want to now uh, welcome Christopher Gregory Rivera. He will be presenting Las Carpetas. And I want to introduce Christian Rodriguez, who will be the moderator. Um, Christian and I met, um, maybe it was like a year ago, I'm not completely sure. Um, he got a scholarship uh, for uh, one of my Strule Media Live classes. And um, I was really happy that he was in that class. He did uh, great work and I loved all the comments and feedback he was giving the others. And so I invited him to um, be uh, a moderator and he invited uh, Chris um, to be the speaker. And I just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Christian. Um, he was born uh, in New York City to immigrants from the Dominican Republic. He studied at the Savannah College of Art and Design. And um, his photography focuses on issues of immigration, cultural identity, and the uh, Dominican diaspora. Um, his work was recently published in the New York Times Magazine. Congratulations on that. And he also wrote and photographed uh, uh, for the opinion section of the New York Times for the Sunday Review, uh, a very touching story about his father. So now I'm going to turn it over to Christian and Christian, if you could introduce Chris and unmute yourself. Welcome everybody. Yo, what's up everyone? It's me, it's Christian. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to see all these faces here. So many, so many faces I don't know, so many faces I do know. So thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I, uh, when Anja came to me about this, uh, the first person I thought about was Chris. Um, because uh, I've always been an admirer of his work, um, both from afar and from close. Uh, and um, I actually got to go see this uh, work that we're about to talk to uh, in person at the Abrams Center in the Lower East Side, uh, where I grew up, which was you know, also very uh, always touching to be in these spaces that um, I've lived through in many phases of my life. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, Chris, Chris G, as I like to call him. Um, uh, Chris, Christopher is from uh, Puerto Rico. He's a Puerto Rican photographer based here in New York City. Um, his work is particularly uh, interested in historical narrative, as you'll learn in this project. Um, something that I really admire about it is um, using photography as a tool for archival research um, and just being able to really uh, get a fuller image and a fuller story on on history, something that's like so evasive and almost like liquid, you know, you can't really, um, I, you know, you can, it's hard to tell what's, what, uh, what it was and what it meant to the people at the time. So I'm super excited to talk about, to, to hear him talk about this because uh, it's fascinating. Um, 
He's also the founding member of a collective called Black Box. They're interested in building immersive stories. Um, he's lectured at ICP as well as taught at ICP. Um, and the list of clients is crazy. Um, it goes on and on and on. Uh, and he's a, a true hustler and I'm just so, um, yeah, I'm just extremely thankful to be sharing this, not only with a colleague, but a friend, someone that, um, that I feel is a friend of mine and a close friend of mine. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, Christopher Gregory, here we are. Thanks, Christian. And um, thanks, Anya. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it's super exciting. And like, uh, I, I'm excited to talk to somebody that I know really well and knows my work. So that's kind of like a different thing from most of these Zoom talks where I'm kind of just talking at a wall. So it's gonna be fun to, to talk to Christian and, and get into it for sure. Um, especially because he's seen so much of the development of this project. Um, but um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about what I do in general and then we can jump into the project. How does that sound? So as Christian mentioned, I'm based in New York. I'm a Puerto Rican photographer. Um, and uh, apart from my artistic practice, I do a lot of commercial um, and editorial work, uh, mostly focused around, as Christian mentioned, like historical narratives, but looking at um, generally marginalized communities and sort of the intersection of power. But a lot of my work, even the commercial stuff is very documentary in nature. Um, I tend to work a lot in Puerto Rico and Latin America, um, but I've also worked um, throughout the rest of the world. So, so yeah, and if you guys have questions about, you know, the other stuff that I do or how I balance any of that stuff, uh, you know, my personal practice versus my professional practice, those questions are welcome. Um, because that's always a hard, a hard thing to, to, you kind of learn it on the job. So happy to impart whatever wisdom I, I can. So, so yeah, this is just kind of like a cross section of some of my work and, uh, the project that we're going to talk about today is this one. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to? Should we look at stuff while I, while, I, uh, while I describe it? Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. I mean, cool. let's do that. Yeah, and you can right. go over some of the images again later. You can go back and forth and, you know, For share sure. or unshare if you want to see everybody in between. Cool. So, Awesome. Yeah, so uh, the project that uh, we're going to talk about is called Las Carpetas, which roughly translates into the files. And it's a, a project I've been working on for the last six years. Um, and it, it sort of started um, with a moment of realization, if you will, in 2013, where I was working as a White House photographer for the New York Times. And it was the moment where the Snowden revelations came to light. Um, and I remember covering the press conference and covering um, a lot of what was going on in DC and I think there was a big conversation around the impact of surveillance and what that had on society. And I remember a lot of people sort of brushing it off saying, you know, oh, well, I have nothing to hide. It doesn't matter if the government's listening. And it immediately brought me back to what happened in Puerto Rico for 40 years, uh, which was uh, very similar, obviously not digital, um, but massive surveillance program, um, not dissimilar to what, um, the NSA is doing digitally. And I think I started the project as a way to understand that surveillance up close and understand what the role of the government and some of these tech techniques were, but more importantly, what the impact was on society. Um, and I think where the project led me was to have some pretty profound realizations, not only about the nature of surveillance and its impact on civil society, but also, um, the nature of how we remember history and how um, the archive, right? And the paper trail and the sort of residue of this bureaucratic program, uh, what that role plays in, in the historic narrative. So the background basically is, um, for those of you who don't, aren't uh, super aware of the, the, the status of Puerto Rico, where Puerto Rico is, is, um, is a colony of the United States, uh, a denomination that was most recently um, 
put forth by President Obama and his administration, um, despite denying its colonial status um, for over 50 years. Um, and it's a possession of the United States. Um, we, everybody who's born in Puerto Rico uh, is a US citizen, but cannot vote for president for the president and has no representation in Congress. Um, and ultimately the power of the government of Puerto Rico and its people lies in Congress. So Congress really has, um, if you legally, the last say on what happens in Puerto Rico. And most recently there was a fiscal control board that controls all of the economics in Puerto Rico. So they can't like, you know, the local legislature here can't pass a budget without this oversight board, um, which Puerto Ricans did not vote for. And that was appointed by the president approving the budgets. So it's a particularly interesting moment to be looking at this history um, because um, I think there's a big question about what the status of Puerto Rico and what um, people on the island want Puerto Rico what that relationship should look like going forward. There's a big part of the, of, of the, it's really half and half. There's half of the population roughly wants um, annexation and to become a state. The other half wants to remain a commonwealth or a territory. Um, and the percentage of people that um, want independence is highest since it's been in the 50s when this program was active. But um, part of what you see with this program that targeted the independence movement was um, the systematic sort of destruction of that particular option or the imagination um, of self-determination and freedom for Puerto Rico. So for about 40 years, um, from the, roughly about the late 30s um, with the creation of the FBI, up until the program was discovered in 1987, um, the Puerto Rican Police Department in conjunction with the FBI um, created a massive surveillance program where they um, surveilled and tracked up to 150,000 people on the island, um, 16,000 of which were extensively tracked. I mean, we're talking 24 seven surveillance, phone taps, um, physical surveillance, intimidation, et cetera. And the, the main sort of confection and, and sort of receipt, if you will, the bureaucratic residue of this, of the surveillance are these files. Um, and I think it's sort of important to, to note and similar to sort of the NSA program, these files are sort of this boogeyman, right? People talk about it like, oh, like, watch out. Like, you know, if you go to a protest, you're gonna be surveilled. Like when I was starting out as a photojournalist, like, I would go to, to protests and my mom would be like, careful, like they're gonna open up a pile on, you know, despite this program having been phased out 20 years prior. Um, so, so uh, you know, when I started this project, I remember seeing the first file, which is the first file that I showed you. Um, and all of a sudden this thing that had been sort of folklore that had been sort of this boogeyman um, was, became very real. And it became very evident that this was a, a very targeted and concerted effort to control civil society. It started with the independence movement, but then really became something that was a state apparatus to suppress any sort of um, political sentiment that wasn't aligned with the status quo. So feminist organizations, environmental organizations, labor unions, I mean, basically anybody who um, didn't follow sort of the government line was targeted by the surveillance program. Um, you know, and it's important to note that like, if you were on one of these lists, you couldn't be employed at the in, in a government office. If you were particularly targeted, um, the police would visit your place of work and tell your employer that you're, uh, you know, subversive and that you, you know, you're communist or socialist which led to a lot of people getting fired. So, you know, this surveillance was not necessarily a passive um, thing as maybe, you know, people generally understand the NSA surveillance to be, for example. Um, it was very active intimidation and, um, you know, often ruined people's lives. And so what's really curious about this is that when these files, uh, when this practice came to light, after an undercover um, 
secret. So another point that's important to note is that this was done by the Puerto Rican Police Department, but it was done by a secret police within the the the, the, the police department, um, and they were called the intelligence the division of intelligence, um, and their whole um, purpose was to um, illegally surveil. Right, like the manual, which is which I actually got a hold of, literally tells the agents like, "Do not get caught because this is unconstitutional." So you know, be careful. Anyway, so uh, when the secret police were, were uncovered in the late 80s, what's really impressive or what's particularly interesting about this program was that unlike the, you know, any other surveillance archive, the, um, the entire police archive um, was deemed property of the people that were surveilled and were returned directly to them. So, you know, the, you basically got a letter in the mail that said, hey, sorry, we watched you for 30 years, come pick up your file. Um, and what people found out, um, like Nestor that you're looking at right now, was that um, the people that had been informing on them and collaborating with the cops turned out to be usually those closest to them. So family, friends, neighbors, um, everybody had been informing on them to the cops, either for money or because they were being intimidated into, into cooperating. Um, in Nestor's particular case, um, his best friend, basically, um, his mother was this man's uh, god, uh, that he was, she was the godmother of his first child, gave him his first car. I mean, this man used to come over every day, you know, every other day, every week um, to spend time with the family. You know, she thought of him as a son, um, and it turned out that he had been an informant. Um, and in their mind, he had been an informant for that entire time for those 20 years. So, you know, I think what's also um, what's also kind of interesting to talk about, maybe I'll just do this, which is easier. Um, what is also sort of valid to talk about um, and what this project starts to get at is what impact this has on the fabric of society, right? Um, a lot of these people are still alive, they live side by side, and what impact, not only knowing that you had been watched and that your political speech had been um, suppressed and surveilled, but also that all of your friendships um, perhaps were not as genuine as you thought they were. Um, and so, so yeah, so the, the, the actual work, which you've been looking at, um, consists of um, photographing as still lives and appropriation of archival images, as well as dealing with documents um, like this one, which is one of the FBI documents, um, which, it, which sort of like this paragraph totally, um, you know, uh, exemplifies exactly what, what they were after, which I can read to you, it just says, your files will, will contain descriptive information appropriate to our investigative reporting. Um, we should delve deeply into the part of their lives which do not show on the surface. For example, we must determine their capabilities of influencing others, capability of real leadership, and why the intense desire for Puerto Rico's independence. What they expect to gain from their independence and what support they have from other leaders and rank and file members. We must have information concerning their weaknesses, morals, criminal records, spouses, children, family life, educational qualifications, and personal activities other than independence movement. Um, and this is, you know, a, a memo from the the direct the San Juan office to the to J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI in 1961. Um, and you know, this methodology of disrupting political speech was. Um, in large part, you know, it sort of pioneered in Puerto Rico in a way, and then applied to the civil rights movement in, in the United States. Um, Puerto Rico was included under the Cointel Pro program, which was a counterintelligence program by the FBI that targeted the civil rights movement, the Black Panthers, um, any basically, um, they would deem them radical groups uh, operating in the United States. Um, 
And the project also contains places. So for example, this is the kitchen in which um, the leader of the Machaderos, which was a, a, a revolutionary um, guerrilla group in Puerto Rico seeking independence. Uh, he was uh, assassinated by the FBI in 2005. Could you show um, it larger? I, I hope nobody else will come in. <laughs> yeah, let's see. I'll, I'll start here and see. There we go. Thank you. Um, so he he died in, in the kitchen because of lack of medical attention. So um, there was a shootout at his house. Um, the FBI shot him and let him bleed for seven hours um, while he died, um, which gets at a little bit of the, you know, I think what's particularly interesting about these files and rescuing some of this history is that it really um, starts to, to get at the psychology and the gaze of the state at some of these political groups um, and that has also permeated larger society because in, in Puerto Rico to this day, there is a big taboo around supporting independence or even talking about it. Um, and you know, the point of this project is not to advocate for independence or any particular political um, position, but rather to have a conversation about self-determination and, and political uh, speech, right? Because I think that um, saying that Puerto Rico as a, you know, as a, as a nation really has true self-determination um, is, you know, you can't, you can't explore self-determination and status and relationship uh, without understanding the history and how the United States, which, you know, is controlling that relationship, has intervened in the psyche and the psychological sort of landscape in Puerto Rico. Um, so, hey Chris, uh, could yeah, you repeat who that was that was shot in the kitchen? Uh, Filiberto, so Filiberto Ojeda Rios. Uh -huh. Yeah, he was the leader of the... Um, I mean, I know it in English, but the Ejército Popular um, Boricua, Macheteros, like Machete. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's um, there's a lot of documentation because it happened in 2005. Um, I mean, he was on the on the FBI's most wanted list. Was actually one of the longest running people. He was a fugitive for over 20 years. Um, because a lot of the, the organizations that sprung up in the 1970s, um, like for example, the Weathermen or some of the, the Black Panthers were pretty open, but um, there were a lot of groups that were forced into, um, to operate clandestinely um, because of the surveillance and because of the apparatus of the state. Um, you know, and I think it's also important to note if while we're on the, the subject of some of these groups is that, you know, these groups were, were identified as the reason why the surveillance was necessary. But the groups were responding to violence by the state. So a lot of the independence groups radicalized um, after particularly violent um, state repression. So for example, um, the first um, armed revolutionary group sprung up in the late 30s after the National Guards, by order of the American and, U and presidential appointed governor, um, decided to open fire on a peaceful demonstration, killing 24 people, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And then, you know, that group took up arms against the government. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's, it's sort of a, when you start to look at these files and when you start to look at the images, it becomes clear that 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 relationship and that contact of power is more complicated than I think is often presented um, abroad, but definitely in Puerto Rico. For example, um, you can't see my cursor, but this is a, so another element of this project, which I think is um, particularly special is that the entire photographic archive of the police, um, I've, I mean, I was one of the first people to look at it. Um, and I've been working with a general archive here in Puerto Rico. Um, and it really gives you, you know, as a photographer, as a visual artist, like I'm interested in that gaze and like what the photographic eye does in this particular context. And so this is a surveillance image from that archive. And you can see, I don't know if it's, it's that visible, but there's numbers on individual people. 
And so the dorso of the print has people's names. Um, and this was very common for most of the images. Um, and this image was taken in 1975, as you can see here. But number 14, Hernando Lario Rosado, who is with glasses, kind of holding his chin like this in the left-hand side of the frame, um, was assassinated three years after this picture was taken by the undercover cop. And that, that particular event was called the Cerro Baramilla massacre. Um, in response to the killing of those two students, um, the Macheteros, the group that I was mentioned earlier, um, whose leader was killed in 2005, um, carried out their first action. So, you know, the, the files also paint sort of a geography of um, what the, the moment in time looked like and, and how people were seeing each other too. Um, this is just a random surveillance image that's loose. Um, this is uh, one of the earlier images that I have. I think it's from the 50s. Um, and he likely was incarcerated under um, the gag law of 1948. So in 1948 until 1956, there was a gag law or that was modeled actually after an, an American law called the Smith Act, which outlawed the flying of the Puerto Rican flag, the singing of the Puerto Rican anthem, speaking about Puerto Rican politics, mainly independence, any of those things could land you to jail. Uh, the army has dropped bombs or the Air Force has dropped bombs on American soil to combat the nationalist uprising in 1950. Chris, what does, it, um, what does it mean when they cut people out of the image, like in that previous image? I have no idea, um, but I thought it was fascinating, right? Like, you know, I think also part of this archival stuff is like, you know, it raises these questions. Some of these don't even have any information. Um, so a lot of it is, a lot of what the process has been for me, for example, is going to people and showing these images to people and trying to rescue some of the oral history around them, you know, and like trying to figure out like who these people were and what their significance was, because it's not, you know, this history is not well documented. So. a lot of protests. And so this is the show that Christian was talking about, um, which was on view earlier this year at the Abrams Art Center. Um, and it was an installation of I don't know how many images, 20 something images and uh, like four panels and a video piece, which you guys saw some stills from. Uh, and if you guys have any questions or like want to talk about the installation or the curatorial perspective, it was curated by Natalia Viera Salgado um, and the graphic design and exhibition design um, was done by Alejandro Torres Viera, who's uh, also a collaborator and close friend who was a member of Black Box as well, is a member of Black Box. Chris, do you mind maybe like taking like maybe 60 seconds to I don't know, to share like what, having sort of like dug deep into this archive, right? And sort of like, mm -hmm. in a way, seeing like your society or like your people reflected in, in, a, in an extreme like level of surveillance, right? Like, like, like six figures of humans being like watched, some of them 24 seven, like, what do you think, how do you think this, relates to a lot of like what we're seeing today and in, 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 in more in the sense of like how, how will we ever find out as the surveillance becomes more sophisticated uh more incognito and tied to your every move not just by imagery but by coordinates possibly by sound uh altitude um et cetera, et cetera. like the, the measurements have 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 become so extreme in some way and a lot of that is facilitated by uh consumer products like phones and watches and computers uh, mm -hmm. or cameras like you know in the street or in the subway or um i, I like I'm, I'm just curious to hear about like how you can maybe tie these two things together yeah i mean 
well, so I'll give you like an example that's rooted in this project, for example, right? So when I talk to a lot of student leaders and activists from the 60s and 70s, something that was very common at the University of Puerto Rico was sort of the complicity of the administration of the university with law enforcement. And so any student leaders that were caught protesting or organizing or were, for example, convicted of disorderly conduct or you know, civil disobedience or whatever, were expelled from the university. Some of those people fought those charges legally and won. Some people literally were never able to return to their studies. In 2017, there was a protest um, and, you know, the co particular context is that the University of Puerto Rico has been gutted financially. Um, and these, pro these, these, these students organized a protest in which they did a sit-in and a board. It was streamed on Facebook Live. And as the government pressed charges against them and through the process of the trial, the government sort of let it slip that the reason the way that they identified a lot of the students and the people that were involved in organizing the protest was through Facebook metadata. And upon further inquiry, they found out that the Department of Justice um, asked for a warrant to Facebook um, for the information of anybody who had interacted with the video. And what they got was information from 5,000 people, private messages, names, address, credit card numbers, et cetera, et cetera, that Facebook just handed over. Um, and, you know, there's only charges against seven students and that case since 2017 is still being appealed by the state. Despite, you know, nobody was hurt. No, you know, some of the charges, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, include like kidnapping, like restricting the freedom of people. I mean, so the state in a way uses this information and this trackability to to exert their, their power, right? And so we see this now with the Black Lives Matter movement, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that there's something to be said about the ability for law enforcement to understand intimately the organization, the working, the, as you say, the metadata, the location, all of this granular information about people say like the Black Lives Matter movement or any of these other ones, um, I mean, yet, you know, in January 6th, a uh, mass of people organized a protest and were clearly coordinated and prepared. So I, I think it's important to understand that like surveillance is, is sold to a general population as something that is preventing the worst from happening, but really, as you see it applied is very often used as a tool of political control. Um, and so, so yeah, you know, I think, I think as we go digital and we, we move into the space, it's important to recognize that um, there is literally nothing we can do, right? Like when you take digital safety classes, the first thing that they tell you is like, it's all about who wants your information, you know? If it's you, Christian, who like, to my knowledge, doesn't know, like, you're not like some crazy, like, you know, white hat, like hacker man, you know? You're not gonna get into my phone. If the NSA, you know, or it's a matter of time. If the NSA wants my information, they're gonna get in. It's just a matter of time, right? Like the more protections and layers of protection you have just slows them down. So we live in a world where I'm not entirely sure if, you, if, if being clandestine is a possibility versus when a lot of this was going on. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's important to, you know, through looking at history like this, through looking at other stuff, you know, both understand what our role is and, and how we are interacting with, um, with this information and metadata and all this other stuff, um, but also how it's used, right? And, and, and you know, the government may not be watching you, but they might be watching somebody in your community who's advocating for, I don't know, uh, 
you know, more, more funding for schools or Clean whatever water. other thing, you know? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I think that's a tendency that is clearly illustrated here in Puerto Rico and is replicated throughout the United States. Um, you know, there's the, the commission in Mississippi and there's all these other surveillance um, archives in the United States, but this one is particularly impressive because it was, they were returned to people directly. The National Archive kept everything that wasn't returned and they're completely unredacted. So you can literally read what the government was paying attention to and what they were interested in. Um, and the fabrication. I mean, there is a lot of information in these files that's completely fabricated. Chris, can I ask you a question? Yeah, for sure. Could you talk a little more about your visual approach? I can see from yep. the images here that most of them are still lives. There's one that is a little more, let's call it documentary because you were on location. Mm -hmm. um, did you do that because it's a project about the past or did you consider also maybe photographing people that were affected by this or did you do that mm -hmm. as well? Or? Yeah, I shot a lot of people. So mostly um, finding a lot of these files until the National Archive um, opened up this archive of all the stuff that wasn't returned. Um, the process was talking to somebody who had a file. They would tell me about other friends that, that, that they knew that had files. And I would go to their homes and I would sit down for an interview and I would you know, talk to them about their experiences, the files, et cetera, et cetera. I would usually do a portrait of them and then I would set up my seamless and my lights and do these still lights of their documents. Um, and I think I gravitated towards the still lives because for me, you know, these objects are made by hand. A lot of them are carbon copy paper. Um, a lot of them are hand stapled, they're rusted, they're sort of yellowed by time. And, you know, I was particularly interested in sort of resurveilling the surveillance um, and, and using something like a still life, which is so, in the way that I do it, is so dry and so like evidentiary, you know, it's like very evidence, like almost forensic. Um, and I think I was mimicking the actual like academic investigation that I was doing into this, into this program with the visual approach. You know, I was very much interested in almost documenting certain things as evidence and as things that I can hold on to as I start to wrap my head around the project. Um, and, you know, the idea is, and ultimately, you know, I hope this becomes a book and I'm sort of working towards that. I hope that like whenever this is seen also, it, it sort of gives you that, that, that guiding thing, right? I mean, you are looking at still lives, but each one has a particular reason for you to be looking and understanding them. Um, so, so I think in that sense, um, it's, you know, it's a, that was a big part of the choice to do, um, to work in still live and to work in, in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually for a while had images of portraits of people in the edit. Um, but I think in a way it, it um, you know, and it was a critique that I received, it, it sort of victimized people when, um, when it, when I don't think everybody who was a part of this felt like victims necessarily, you know? Um, and I think it inter, it, it, it creates um, an emotional connection that I think I would prefer people to have with understanding the surveillance and the sort of the, the state and, and what that does to politics um, rather than to individual people, even though that's a big part of it. Um, in this particular iteration, you know, this project has taken on many forms. And most recently I did a podcast where it was like all about that, right? Like it was all about interviewing, talking to people and like uncovering history and interviews and that kind of stuff. Does that answer your question? Yes. I mean, it just also shows that you could tell the story in so many different ways, also on different places, like on the web in a different way than in the book, obviously. And Absolutely. I think that's fascinating. Um, there are so many different directions one could go with that. Um, yeah. I would love to also hear more about the exhibition, uh, how you told the story in that space. Um, totally. It's a beautiful space. 
And uh, I'm just wondering how you decided to tell the story there. You said somebody did the installation design, so you had a collaborator on figuring mm -hmm. out those details. Yeah, so it's a, it's, I mean, it's a great space um, and the organization is amazing. The curator Natalia um, has a residency in which she's doing various programming, both at the center at Abrams in the Lower East Side and in um, a space that she co-founded here in Puerto Rico called Publica. So um, yeah, the opportunity presented itself. And so we thought about, you know, how do we show this and also, you know, as you pointed out, Anja, which is a big sort of guiding principle for um, the collective um, that I founded with Natalie Kesar, Jake Knott, and, and Alejandro, the designer, Black Box is, is you, you know, our sort of approach to that and that really informed my practice um, through that collaboration. And I think all of our practices was to sort of look at the space and the environment and the medium that you're working in and to, to really think about how you maximize the story and what you're doing in that space right like not everything fits right like a photo essay doesn't fit a gallery wall doesn't fit a web presentation doesn't fit an artist talk doesn't fit a zine in the same way right so i think it's about looking at the project expansively um rather than completely aesthetically although there was like obviously big aesthetic considerations in the, the show so um the space is, is is amazing but strange because there's basically on the right is a semicircle of glass and then these panels of gallery space um so we basically broke down each panel and started to design around it to think about what um, what it could look like and what we could do, um, you know. And this is just another example, also of you know how this works out in the real world. So um, to be able to do this installation and stuff, I had actually just exhibited this in the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. So the frames that we had were from that show that was actually shown in a completely different configuration. And so we brought that and then designed around those frames and did the wallpaper and did the art object that we that we distributed um, for for this show. Um, a big part of the decision to do this sort of overlay situation with the wallpaper was um, a broader point about this project, which is the fragmentation of the archive, right? So this archive was returned directly to people, which in some in some circles is seen as sort of this like justice was done, right? The files were returned to the people and they have their information and the government kept no copies. But, you know, what the effect of that has been in Puerto Rican society is that it's been forgotten, right? That, that it's been designed to be returned to individuals and treat this as an individual issue when it was it happened to the entire island. Right. And so the idea of no collective process around the remembering of a particular political violence has led to a kind of a collective amnesia about what happened. Right. People who were surveilled and who were, you know, involved in these political movements remember it like every day. But everybody else seems to think that that never happened. Um, and it's because of the way that it was returned and how it was treated and that there was no collective process. So. We wanted to reflect that in the installation. So that's why you have these frames that are floating, that you have the, the wallpaper to sort of create those layers of fragmentation. And then there's um, pairings that are very particular um, uh, that have a whole sort of conceptual underpinning to it. Um, like the one that you're seeing on the left there is uh, files that are at people's homes over the actual archive, the National Archive of everything that wasn't returned which sort of represents these two archives. Um, then there's FBI documents that are on the wall, um, like this one. Uh, yeah. And then additionally, like we were really interested in, in sort of interacting with the community of the Lower East Side because of its, um, you know, Puerto Rican and Caribbean roots. Um, still to this day, there's a lot of people in the Lower East Side that, um, are either descendants or Puerto Rican immigrants, you know, first, second generation, third generation. And so showing the link 
between the Puerto Rican community and the Puerto Rican movement and New York uh, was sort of a big, um, was something that we wanted to incorporate, which I hadn't incorporated before in the work. But for the exhibition, I said, all right, like, let me look for files in English, for example, and files that mention New York and talk about that um, link um, to sort of make it more understandable for the particular community in which the show the show was being shown the work was being shown um, and then because of covid we were like nobody's going to come see the show so we made these art objects um and we made a checklist that um is not really a checklist it's more of like a like a little like booklet um at, and we were really lucky that the show was well attended and there was a lot of people that came um but also people can sort of take this booklet and start to digest the information on their own and it's sort of an invitation to you know for people to do their own research um, yeah chris can you share um where where we can find the podcast you mentioned earlier yeah i'll send it, i'll send a link to it but it's it called la brega and it was produced a co-production with wnyc um, and Futuro Media, um, and okay. I produced one of the episodes on it, um, which is about Las Carpetas, which uh, the informant that I mentioned earlier in, uh, in the in this talk, uh, that was very close to, was like a son to this woman and turned out to be an informant. Um, what I do on the podcast is I go look for him and I talk to him which is, was a really interesting experience. Great. I, I linked it so everybody can jump in the chat. I linked um, the podcast, uh, yeah. the video you have on Vimeo, and I linked uh, Christopher's uh, Instagram as well. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, so, and, and you know, if you're interested in learning more about the history of Puerto Rico, I encourage you to listen to the rest of the episodes. They're both in English and Spanish, um, each episode. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, the Alana Casanova, who Burgess, who is the founder of that, or like made the podcast, um, did a really good job of curating stories and reporting stories herself um, in a way that I think is is pretty exciting. Sweet, Anja, do you feel we should move on to some Q and A or? Sure, let's see if anybody has any questions. I have I have a difficult question. First, uh, Chris, I just want to say, I think, I think this is an incredible investigation. My question goes to you on a more personal level, because ah. on mm -hmm. a personal level, I, I assume you're involved um, with this history and your presentation moved towards a documentary. And then you also talk about being involved in the commercial world. So how mm -hmm. do you navigate? How did you manage to navigate these three areas um, of why you were putting this together? Yeah, totally. So um, basically, um, a lot of what I do sort of in my professional life, and for example, when I do commercial work, um, is to fund this project um, and to fund some of my other personal projects. Um, so in that sense, you know, there is sort of a direct relationship um, for between a lot of these, these projects. Um, but that's also in part why it took me six years to do, because I was busy doing a lot of other um, assignments. Um, luckily, a lot, a lot of those assignments were here in Puerto Rico, especially after the hurricane. Um, so I got to keep kind of keep working on this as I would do. I would tack on a day or two at the end of my other reporting trips and I would you know, go do a project or whatever. Um, and what's interesting about this project, which is like kind of mind blowing, is when you really tally up the shooting days, it's like maybe two, three weeks, like over six years, but the investigation, finding people, coordinating the shoots, all of that stuff took a lot of time. And also just making sense of what I had made um, has taken a long time. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I was doing a lot of other work in between, which I think partially as well was, was just taking so long. Yeah, no, I, th I find that incredible, the clarity with which you bring this to us. Um, when, when, when now I understand it took you six years to find this, it's, it's quite incredible. Do you think your eye for commercial uh, photography 
helped you in terms of the way you put some of these still lives together on, on that formal level? Yeah, well, it's actually funny because this work actually got me commercial work. <laughs> Um, because, uh, I mean, because the original edits of the work were still lives and portraits, um, and the portraits were very lit, um, you know, very much kind of like in, in, in the style of my other work, uh, paired with these, with these still lives. And I think that art directors and editors kind of saw that and saw my lighting and were interested in, in applying that to, to my commercial and my editorial work. I mean, I've literally gotten, um, like mood boards, right, of my own work. They're like, oh, we want you to do like this kind of stuff, the, the type of work of viewers that we like. Um, and I've gotten this project, which I'm, you know, I'm over the moon. Like, I'm like, all right, great. I'm excited. You know, when the editors like take pictures of objects, I'm like, I, that's my thing. I'll show you guys quickly an assignment that I got literally off of this. So you guys are going to have to excuse the that I, I do this like thing on Instagram where I do like colored backgrounds. So I had to pull this off there, but you'll get a sense of it. Yeah. So this was a, a, a person who uh, passed away due to COVID um, at the height of COVID in, in April. And so hospitals were overwhelmed by objects that people had in their possession. But since there was no next of, next of kin um, because people couldn't visit the COVID patients, they had these like huge like warehouses full of people's objects. And one of those patients was um, this man actually who went to my high school in Puerto Rico, I found out later, that Rafael Eli who passed away in April. And so his, one of his best friends got his objects and my editor at the New York Times was like, do the surveillance thing with these objects of this person who has passed away. Um, and so that's what I did. So that's kind of an example of how the personal work cross pollinates into the to the professional world. Um, this is you know his bedroom, wow. so it's a lot of that kind of um, you know evidentiary quality and that kind of case. That was for the New York Times, did you say? When mm -hmm. was that published? It was published last summer. Uh huh. Yeah. I have to look that up. I don't, I don't know these images. Yeah, it's a very moving story because it's sort of the story about this person who's, who's passed away um you know and everything that he kind of left behind through the gaze of the people that knew him it actually reminds me a little bit of a project by a photographer called laia abril um called the epilogue which is about uh, a young woman who dies um who loses a battle against bulimia um and uh it's the story of every everybody who's left behind so it's kind of the epilogue right um, and it's a really interesting project. So this is the process of his friends cleaning out his place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the oh. objects that, that he had when he passed away. What's up? And how much time did you have to do that? Was that like uh, This an whole hour thing or was two, a two day shoot. A two day shoot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I was there for a long time. So both days I was there for a particularly long time. That's um, a lot of time for an assignment like that. I mean, that they would let you, that they would give you that much time, no? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 i mean it was you know it was a feature and it was kind of they they, they wanted to do a big treatment for it online etc so they you know i think they felt that that there there was stuff there to do that is great yeah um, more questions yeah. from anybody christian i mean we have a question in the chat here uh from shari hey shari uh, Shari actually introduced me to Anja. Um, did you uh, discover uh, anyone in your family who had been surveilled or anybody who you personally knew or someone? Um, not initially. Uh, I kind of started the project because my mom thought she had, well, I, I didn't start it, but like when I started the project, my mom was like, oh, I for sure have a file. And so I looked and she didn't. <laughs> um, but um, it's been funny because the more I've started to like look at like read research and connect with people, <laughs> I've started finding people in the files. Like I'm like, man, that looks like Ricardo. And I like take a picture of it and I send it to him. And he's like, oh yeah, that's totally me. And like, you know, first year of university. And I'm like, whoa. So it's interesting to like have these images and start to connect a lot of that history with people that I know now. I mean, you know, they're older and 
they, you know, they were in college in the 60s and 70s, but it's been interesting to like have people that I knew that I know now and connect that part of their lives. And, and it also sparks a conversation, which is sort of the broader point of this work is to have a conversation, right? In the United States, it's a conversation perhaps about, you know, the power and the relationship with Puerto Rico, but in Puerto Rico, it's more of a conversation of the same thing within the context of, of what it means here. Um, and to spark that conversation between people, right? Because a lot of people were surveilled. And so somebody might not know even that somebody had been so extensively surveilled. Especially like, you know, sort of like having visited Puerto Rico multiple times, having close friendships with a lot of like young creators and people who have been like sharing stories about Puerto Rico and the state of things in Puerto Rico between Puerto Rico itself and the United States. And like sort of being aware about the conversations that like half the country is very like anti-statehood. And then you have like half of this other side of the country that's kind of like gun ho for statehood. And um, yeah, imagining this kind of like information um, being like dispersed in a wide format that everyone could like digest. It, it's really like interesting to think about how they might react to um, basically being used, you know, or abused by, by, the, by, the, by the party that they sort of like want to become a part of. Totally. Yeah, I mean, and that's the broader point is, you know, is, look, I mean, the, the point of the project is to talk about self-determination, right? If an overwhelming percent of, po of the population in Puerto Rico wants to become a state, fantastic, right? That's what the democratic process is, and that's what it should be. But it's important for that percentage of the population or that, that person to understand the history and understand the relationship so that they can advocate for equality, right? They right. say, hey, look, yeah. <laughs> the way that this happened or what's happened in the past is unacceptable. So if we're going to become a state, we need to set the ground rules. You know, it's yeah. sort of like, if you're going to, if you're going to marry somebody who was not that nice to you, you should be <laughs> like, yo, we're going to get married, but like, yeah. chill out, you know, don't do the thing that you were doing. It's definitely like reminiscent of like some Brexit stuff. You know, it's just like hearing of all those people who were like, Oh, I had no idea. Just voted. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I mean, Puerto Rican politics is a whole nother mm -hmm. talk. But at least the idea is is to shed light on the history. Yeah, it's the same thing when you talk about like, um, you know, voter registration issues in the states. It's like, well, yeah, mm -hmm. the the law isn't explicitly racist, but like that's the way it works in practice. And so it's important to understand the history of where that's coming from to understand the contemporary applications of it. So sure. So Anybody? the next thing. Uh, sorry, Christian. The yeah. next thing for you is making a book, or are you actually still working on the project, like expanding it into a different direction, or not really? Um, so, I've become like a like an inadvertent archivist in this whole process. Obviously, I, as you guys might be able to see. Um, so the next sort of phase is to get funding um, to spend a long time, literally combing through investigating the police archive and digitizing a large part of that archive for the book. And then also doing sort of like guerrilla, um, more guerrilla sort of archiving and going into people's homes and digitizing documents and photographing more. So basically it's more of the same, but I think, you know, also helping the, you know, the helping in digitization efforts and preservation efforts in conjunction with you know, producing the book and producing my project. The idea is to eventually do an exhibition here in Puerto Rico, um, that's sort of a bigger one. I mean, that is gonna require a lot of work because it sort of has to be done right because it's a very like polarizing issue. Um, but hopefully the book will coincide with that exhibition. Well, that sounds like a, that sounds like a good plan for sure yeah. to show it in Puerto Rico, that's so important. Yeah, everybody book your tickets to Puerto Rico. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, what do you think? A couple years? Yeah, a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, are there any more questions? Yes, uh, Bärbel, unmute yourself, please. Um, I was struck by uh, you. Uh, first, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And of course, it's for me um, in a way touchy because I'm thinking I'm from Germany. I'm thinking of what yeah, happened in East course. Germany. And there's this comparison and that people would get their files sent home 
is unimaginable. You 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 had to apply to go there and see your file. Yeah? And, mm -hmm. uh, so and and this is thirty years back that it got open, and uh, I think they were thinking of dissolving it now because it's now for thirty years. I have to look that up that part of the history. But uh, what I thought uh, remarkable was that you said through this giving it back, um, people got in a in a in a mood of forgetting uh, what happened. Yeah. So I wonder when you come after they have so to say forgotten, and you come and ask them and to see the file again, and discuss how do they feel, how did they react, and were people like thinking we don't want to hear that story anymore or how were the reactions so that that would be yeah i mean um yeah it's super interesting because the 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 shazi archive is like a is in in a, in a large way and it'd be interesting to um i mean it's a longer conversation but you know send me an email or whatever we can talk is um that is sort of like the golden the guiding principle of like how surveillance should be archived which is interesting um, uh, because it was one of the first massive surveillance programs that was archived in that way. And it was about the same time as the Puerto Rican one. Uh, but the, the reactions are like very, very, you know, some people have made it, uh, sort of a life goal to expose this history and they're very vocal about it. And they're very, you know, interested in talking about it. Other people very reluctantly talk about it, you know, because they don't want to be seen as this person that they were, or they they perhaps don't have the same political ideologies. Um, and other people, like you know, they had no idea that they were being surveilled, and it didn't really impact their life, and they got this file, and it's just sort of this like weird object that they have in their home. Um, so. So I think there is like a, a wide variety of experiences around the files for sure. <clears throat> and on top of that, you know, I think, I mean, I, you know, I'm not super well-versed in the history, for example, of Germany and, and what that, that process was like, but it, it strikes me, I mean, I'm more in, in more informed with like, for, for example, the the transition of power outside of like South American dictatorships, right? Where these surveillance documents were, were revealed and there were truth and reconciliation processes, for example. That has never happened in Puerto Rico. Um, there are particular instances like the Cerro Maravilla murder that are, in, are remembered in the collective imagination. But this particular surveillance wasn't because it wasn't seen, um, you know, when this came to light, the government was like, we want to burn the documents. <laughs> and they were like, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so the red documents were rescued and then they were given back to people. But there was no statement. I mean, the, the government was sort of like, hey, sorry, you know, we, we were surveilled you. If you were surveilled, come pick up, you know, $3,000. We'll give you $3,000 for your damages and deal with it. You know, when it was 30 years of people's lives that were ruined. You know, they, they weren't able to hold down a job. A lot of people went into like private practice or freelance work because they couldn't have a paycheck, you know. So there was no collective sort of reckoning or reasoning um, with the local police or the local government and much less more reckoning with the FBI and the federal interventions that happened here. So I think in that sense, despite, you know, the the incredible access that you have with these documents. I mean, literally the informants are completely decodified, right? Like you can look up the code and be like, oh, this person surveilled me and they were my neighbor. Um, and then you like cross the street and you talk to them, you know, like that was a possibility within this. And, and it just never, it never sparked a national conversation because it was so taboo. And because there was a real sense that anybody who was advocating for an alternative political reality was, you know, was a was a subversive, you know, was was to be shunned. Right. Um, Bebel, uh, thanks for asking that question. That was really great to hear also this comparison and that the fact that people had these files sent home to them. It, I mean, this whole thing is so wild in a way. It's now yeah. I think now it's really hitting me. <laughs> um, okay, I think uh, we should wrap it up. Um, if anybody still has a question, please ask now. Uh, you can also stay. So um, I think now is the moment for anybody who wants to say hi, please stay. Um, and the others, I want to thank you again for being here and for donating. Mm -hmm.